for the past 15 years since 2000. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist that specializes largely in prostate cancer. When we talk about research, there's many different types. There's basic, which is fundamental, you know, science, you know, working in the lab, tinkering, mechanistic studies, trying to figure out how cancer works at the very fundamentals. Then there's clinical, which is like a clinical trial, trying to figure out if a drug or a, a therapy works in people. And then there's something in between, which is translating what we learn in the lab into the clinic to help a broad population of men obviously do better. And there's also something called reverse translation, which is where you take what you learn in the clinic and bring it into the lab to inform on research that can go back and forth. So a clinical understanding that's very important right now is our men who have a BRCA2 mutation, where we learned through clinical studies, genetic sequencing, that some men have this hereditary form of prostate cancer that they may have inherited from a mom with breast or ovarian cancer or a dad with prostate cancer. These are familial syndromes. And then we brought those findings into the lab to figure out what drugs could kill tumors that have these inherited DNA repair alterations that could make the cancer more vulnerable. These are aggressive tumors that led to the development of a class of drugs called PARP inhibitors, Olaparib or Linparza as an example, that that was brought back into the lab and the, a big clinical trial was completed about a year ago that demonstrated that that approach improves survival. And now we use it in the clinic. We're also trying to understand now what drives PARP inhibitor resistance or other therapies that uh, target these pathways. And so we're bringing that back into the lab. So it's an <clears throat> iterative process. You know, you, you keep advancing as you develop therapies that are successful. It brings up new questions. When I engage for the very first time with a new patient, you know, I, I, I try to understand them as a person and try to explain to them the situation they're going through, not at using a lot of scientific jargon, but to, to help them understand, you know, the enemy they're facing in their disease, the various menu of treatment options, understand them and their medical issues, their preferences, their choices. And the menu is going to be different for different patients, you know, based on their prior therapies, their other health issues, their age, comorbidities and you know how their disease has progressed you know the various stages that cancer of the prostate can progress through the pattern of spread there's all sorts of different factors and even their genetics is now a, a major factor in in treatment selection so you know the first part of the consultation is you know a back and forth dialogue them telling me about themselves and, and me listening <laughs> And then me asking questions as well to get to know them and their preferences, but also to explain things so that they can understand the disease they're faced with. So it's always a good idea to go to your doctor, especially a medical oncologist, with a, a good list of you know, key questions so that you can take away from that you know, uh, a menu of options so that you can uh, make a decision. It doesn't have to be at that minute. You shouldn't be under pressure. <clears throat> to make a major life Im improving decision, perhaps at that moment, <clears throat> but to take that back, either if it's a second opinion, take it back to a doctor that you've had a long-standing relationship with, or to get a follow-up visit to keep asking those questions. So, you know, think of the medical oncologist as somebody who's part of your team. You may have been cared for by a urologic oncologist or a radiation oncologist. And if your cancer has relapsed, or is very advanced where you need um, medical therapy. That's what medical oncologists do is they give medicines. Um, the medical oncologist is gonna be integrated as part of that team. Uh, so I kind of explain that and, and how we work together in a, what's called a multidisciplinary fashion. Uh, we do a lot of precision medicine, genetic testing, but largely we do a lot of explaining and talking. That's kind of our forte. <laughs> We do a, a lot of consultations around these choices. Urologists, as you know, are very busy operating all the time and, you know, honestly do have a limited amount of time to spend with patients. So medical oncologists, their role is often to help navigate for patients, you know, this complex uh, treatment decision. There's other specialists. There's palliative care physicians who can get involved for symptom management. There's primary care doctors who really know the patient and their health conditions and may be asked 
to continue to manage patients and some of the side effects of our therapies. And prostate cancer and not all patients need all the information on all the therapies that may not be relevant for them at that given time. It has gotten increasingly complicated. For a newly diagnosed patient with metastatic disease, it's overwhelming. And so we kind of first start off talking about the disease and the symptoms and how we're going to start with hormonal therapy. Maybe we talk about adding some of these new oral agents for chemotherapy, that's enough. You know, that's going to take a full hour. Maybe we save the genetic testing and the genetic counseling and whether to do, you know, germline or what's called hereditary cancer assessment. That's going to be a different day when things have settled down, when we can focus on that kind of question. And we're not going to necessarily discuss all of the possible therapies that could be in their future at that moment. <clears throat> some of the clinical trials that we're doing now are trying to treat those metastatic sites like the prostate, but if it's in a bone or a lymph node with a course of radiotherapy or surgery uh, to target, that's called metastasis directed therapy. And then, you know, to stop the systemic therapy once a patient has achieved what's called a complete remission. And a complete remission would be defined as a, the PSA zero or very low. And the imaging has shown regression of disease. And that would be an opportunity to stop these systemic therapies and return to a, a good quality of life. And so that's, that's under investigation right now. I wouldn't say it's necessarily the standard of care, which remains kind of continuous treatment to remain in remission because you know, many patients do relapse when you stop therapy. We're seeing that increasingly more common with more sensitive imaging where we're able to detect metastatic disease that we had no idea was present in the past. And we even do see it in certain patients that have genetic subtypes that are responsive to immunotherapy. I have about five patients, for example, that have what's called microsatellite unstable prostate cancer, MSI high prostate cancer, where they're they've been able to achieve a complete remission with a immunotherapy called pembrolizumab. That's rare. You know, I don't want to say that's common, but you know, when you see this happen, it really blows your mind and you want to keep doing it. <laughs> and, you know, patients being able to stop therapy is kind of the holy grail of, of a medical oncologist career is where you, you can stop your therapy and see the patient do well without that, the need for that therapy. But, uh, you know, I think we're getting towards that. You know, I don't want to say that that's the rule. It is the exception still. We always hope for it. And when it happens, we celebrate with the patient.